Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Welcome to episode 46 think, of the ESG show. And today we're talking about double materiality. Now, we are all affected by the environment. But then again, we, all, we also affect the environment. So that's a kind of double effect, a double-edged sword, if you will. And I think that captures the spirit of double materiality. But let's dig deeper. Let's start with the definition of materiality. And here I start with a, an irritation because when I looked up the defi definition of materiality, I me immediately get taken to a document of several thousand words, which does not have a succinct definition. So that's not a good start. But when I go to the IS SASB site, it defines uh, materiality as an accounting principle that refers to any information that would impact the judgment of an investor. So that's SASB. But alas, we have a contradiction because um, the Global Reporting Initiative uses a quite different definition. And if you can excuse me, I'll call it up. GRI says materiality is used to filter in the information that is or should be relevant to users. Particular information is considered material or relevant if it, is, if it can influence the decision making of stakeholders in respect of the reporting company. OK, so that's materiality. Double materiality looks in, in and out. It looks at the environmental impact on a company and the company's impact on the environment. But I think that's enough for me. Today, we have three experts who know double materiality, as it were, inside out and outside in. So let's meet the guests. And today we have Bob, Bob Willard, returning guests. Hello guests, hello Bob, how are you today? And where are you in the world today? I'm great and I'm in Whitby, Ontario, just outside of Toronto which got a huge storm yesterday and, and flooded a lot of the locations around the city. Oh, did it really? All oh, right. OK, well, sorry to hear that. I hope everyone's OK. Yep. Good. OK, so. Bob is a sustainability guru. In the last 12 years, he has authored six books, published two white papers, given over 1,700 presentations and created over a dozen free open source tools for sustainability champions. Now, Bob, you recently told me that ESG considerations are what companies used to pay attention to when they had nothing better to do. Now they are a business imperative. Can you clarify? Yeah, sure. Um, it's, um, it's really because of the attention that bankers and investors and insurers are starting to pay to pay to this topic that uh, companies are starting to realize that if it's important to bankers, providers of capital, um, it's important to them. So although all the pointed questions that are coming today are coming from different stakeholders from the financial community, they're very similar to the same questions that were asked uh, previously by people who are interested in um, the concern about how a company was impacting the environment and society, especially the local community. So it's about the same topics. It's just that the questions are coming from different people and they are getting a lot more attention because of that, because for whatever reason, in a capitalistic society, providers of capital are deemed to be <laughs> important stakeholders. Okay, thank you for that, Bob. Now, uh, also on the show today is Petter. Petter, Petter Binder, how are you today? I'm fine, thank you. I'm great to be here with you, Michael. Well, lovely to have you. And um, whereabouts in the world are you today? I am in Geneva, Switzerland, and uh, it's a warm and sunny day here. Good. Well, it's warm and sunny here as well, actually. We're just on the verge of having a mini heat wave, I think. Uh, so, Petter is the author of the ESG Sprint, um, and he's the founder of Bind International Management Style, based in Geneva, which does consulting and advisory work in strategy, digital and ESG, as well as turnaround, interim and change management. 
He is the author of the recently pub published book, ESG Sprint, Seven Steps to Get Your Business Quickly on Track for a Sustainable Future. He has broad international management experience and has successfully led a number of strategic change processes, including turnarounds, restructuring, M&A, performance improvement, customer experience, digital and technology implementation. He has management and board experience from many countries, including Switzerland, Norway, Sweden, UK, US, Mexico, Colombia, Brazil, Argentina, Turkey, India, Australia, and New Zealand. So, Peter, um, you, you were telling me recently that you think double materiality is a hyped, hyped up term, but it's also a common sense approach. Can you expand on that, please? Sure, yes. I did not uh, mean that uh, to be dismissive of the uh, term of um, double materiality, but you could say that it's a bit hyped up in the sense that it is um, a bit of a fancy label on something that is really a very common sense approach. And um, by that, I mean that business leaders really uh, always need to be able to understand and assess both risks and opportunities that are facing their business. This is really at the core of good uh, business and uh, good uh, business management and strategy. And you need to understand and evaluate risks as well as opportunities. You need to assess and, uh, and uh, mitigate the risks and you need to also um, assess and uh, develop and leverage the opportunities. And um, of course, you need to understand this both in the context of how the external world is impacting your business as well as how your business is impacting the world. And this is really what double materiality is. And accounting for this in ESG terms is really what double materiality is. And so um, in terms of being a hyped up term, uh, what I'm re referring to there is that uh, the the, the, the sort of um, the sort of vocabulary as well as the um, uh, all the regulatory kind of environment that you are faced with uh, in in the world of ESG and uh, sustainability can be a bit overwhelming and uh, so this term that uh, is getting a lot of attention and uh, surely it can also feel a bit overwhelming in terms of uh, both understanding and approaching. Um, my point here is that it is really a very common sense uh, approach that uh, goes to the core of how you should be running and assessing your business. And uh, so that is that is uh, where you need to start from. You, the risks and the opportunities that are facing your business and how they are impacting both you as well as how you are impacting um, the world external to you. Okay, thank you for that, Petter. Um, and also on the show today, we have uh, Runa, uh, Runa Rocker. How, how, how are you today, Runa? And where, and where are you? Uh, thank you, Michael, and thank you for uh, inviting me to the show. Um, I am uh, sitting right now in, uh, in the middle of Norway, a town called Trondheim. Very nice. Well, so Runa is the founder of I don't know how to pronounce this one, I'm afraid. Can you say this next word for me? <laughs> yeah, it's Klimafinans uh, in Norwegian. It's uh, climate finance, uh, direct uh, translation to, to, to English, yeah. Uh, can say, yes, but MSc in finance, 25 years of company assessments and project finance, which is now integrated with 10 years of deep dive passion on the unprecedented nature and climate, climate related financial risks and opportunities relevant for most business model strategies and company valuations. Um, so, so Bruna, I think you were wanted to have a brief conversation about the, uh, the relationship between double materiality and banking. Um, can you set the scene for us and um, talk about how sustainability relates to risk, to risk, how sustainability relates to risk in a banking context? Sure. Um... The banking sector or the, the capital markets are, um, are um, uh, the most important thing for them are the risk of, uh, of uh, either the company they have invested in or the company they have uh, lent money to. So uh, the banking sector are have one priority, 
that is to assess risk. Put a price on that risk and allocate capital uh, based on that risk. And uh, so it's a, so in the banking sector, it's, a, it's, a, it's common to, to uh, assess uh, company risk. And that uh, means uh, the future cash flow uh, in that company in order to, to repay uh, loans. And loans are also uh, usually uh, a long term, like five years, seven years, 10 years, uh, 15 years. So the assessment has to go that far, but it has not done that yet. So also the banking sector have a long, uh, long uh, view of risk, but it's only one year, two year, three year uh, ahead. So it's not uh, enough. So therefore, uh, the finance community have, uh, have uh, during a lot of uh, years now, it started in 2014, I, I um, uh, in my view, 2014, 2015, and have done a lot of uh, assessments on the financial stability uh, connecting to the climate change uh, and the na nature degradation. So it's emerging risks on uh, on the high level. So how do we take this high level down to a company loan? And now, uh, finally, in uh, in in May, um, um, EU decided uh, to uh, adopt uh, the capital uh, requirement directive. It's a um, directive uh, uh, based on the Basel uh, uh, rules, uh, which are also, also uh, new rules that, that are trying to um, incorporate uh, climate and nature uh, based financial risks. Uh, so uh, right now we have a lot of in, uh, lot of uh, lot of uh, uh, studies, but now uh, now but the banks are also a bit a bit. They, the speed is uh, is needed to 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 increase. So uh, so this uh, new capital requirements directive should uh, instruct or should uh, 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 um, um, it has um, it should it should um, it should um, uh, instruct the the banks on how much equity. Uh, each uh, loan should be uh, in the books of the bank. Uh, so, yeah. Okay, Rena, thank you for that. And yeah. how does this, um, and how does all this apply to double materiality? In uh, in the risk um, in the risk area, uh, the double materiality is a risk uh, assessment, basically. So it's always been. So the double materiality concept is, uh, is a new word for the same uh, risk uh, management as uh, usual, but it has been <laughs> a new word that could, could uh, also um, make it easier to, to implement ESG risks uh, by implementing this uh, this concept of double materiality but the double materiality is uh, basically the the basic risk uh, assessment what uh, what uh, factors do uh, uh, affect the company's cash flow and that's a common um, that's a common uh, that's a common uh, way of uh, of thinking of risk and now okay. the, yeah, and now this uh, this nature degradation and especially the climate and, and CO two emissions are are uh, um, a new and uh, and uh, material risk. Yeah. Okay, thank you for that. And can you kind of drill down, maybe give us an example of, of you know how how this would work with, in the banking context? Yeah, this is uh, this is uh, um, uh, yeah. We can we can jump to this. Uh, the, the, the banks have uh, have uh, their own uh, risk model, um, and uh, they are also different. The, the large banks have the internal uh, risk models, which they have uh, uh, 
uh, adopted by themselves and, and approved by, by the, the financial regulations. And the smaller banks have this standard way of, uh, of uh, implementing risks from uh, the financial uh, regulators. So now, uh, one, one, uh, one flow in the, in, the, in the financial sector is, uh, is uh, to see the, for example, on the climate side, uh, this is an example, an illustration uh, on, the, on the environmental risk weighted assets, which are now on, uh, on in, uh, discussion on how, how to do it, but intensity uh, metrics um, are now uh, uh, starting to be used in in uh, in risk assessment. So if you have um, and uh, intensity ratios is, for example, a building. Uh, how many kilowatt hours do that uh, building use per square meter? That could be one intensity. And if you use a l a little, you get a good grade like an A. And uh, and if you have a um, uh, not so well um, performed uh, building, you get a, a lower grade. And that will also reflect um, the, the credit margin, the price you have to pay, and the amount of money, the loan to value uh, uh, that this building is, is able to, to, to get from, from the banks. And also on the ships and, uh, and, uh, and uh, other assets, the intensity metrics is uh, is uh, starting to to make uh, make uh, <coughs> okay thank you for that luna thank you um now um i'm going to bring everybody back on and we're gonna oh thank you for your comments by the way thomas um um i'm a says he's a fan of the esg show so always delighted to get comments like that and i'm afraid um this person's name hasn't come up so i'm not quite sure what that is but uh amazing i like the comment amazing anyway sorry your name isn't, doesn't appear um that's it's, it's, you're probably not anonymous on linkedin sometimes these technologies don't quite work how they how they're supposed to now bob you um were quite interested i think in in csrd materiality assessments um, which has been introduced in the EU. Um, can you sort of expand on that a little bit? What, what, um, why, uh, um, what, what are your thoughts about this? What, what, why is CSRD so important, do you think? Yeah, CSRD is really important. It, and it's um, another example of European leadership in this uh, area. Um, in North America, um, reports on sustainability, corporate social responsibility, et cetera, have always been voluntary. In Europe, they're now required. Uh, depending on the size of company and so on, over time, we're gonna phase in uh, most companies, especially least listed companies. That's a big difference. Now, this is not something that's optional. It is required, that's huge. So the second thing that really impresses me about the CSRD, the Corporate Social Reporting Directive from the EU, is that it's the only one which includes double materiality. It looks not only at the way in which an organization, a company, is impacting the environment and society, but it's also looking at the way in which it is exposed to risks from impacts coming from the environment and from society onto the organization and how that could affect the future future financial statements of the organization. That's huge. Um, there, the Global Reporting Initiative has always been used to describe the inside out kinds of impacts and the uh, TCFD, the International Sustainability Standards Board approaches have been looking at the outside in one. The European CSRD looks at both. That's that's huge. And the third thing is, um, it is not only looking at the organization's own impacts on the environment and society, it's looking at the, uh, the entire value chain's impact on society 
and on the environment. And that's really, really important. And in fact, the CSRD is being driven by a directive, a due diligence directive that came out of the European Union that said, by the way, you're not only responsible for your own impacts, but you're also responsible and accountable for the impacts of your subsidiaries and your suppliers. That is huge. And you are required to do due diligence on how it's going with them, especially in the area of human rights and modern slavery kinds of issues, and not only be able to detect that those are happening, but take action to mitigate them. That is massive. And there are financial penalties. If you don't step up to this, the reporting as well as the due diligence, that is huge. This is the first time we've, we've had that kind of um, requirement, not a request, but a requirement that companies um, are as transparent as, as they need to be to be able to step up to the CSRD. So it, it's, it's coming. And, Euro and European companies are, of course, subject to it, but non-EU companies are also subject to it if they're doing business in the EU, EU or enough business in the EU. So it's got a ripple effect, which it's fantastic. Okay, okay thanks for that. Well, I have a uh, comment on that, uh, if, uh, if it's possible. Sure. The CSRD are very, really important, but it also have a clone uh in the international IF, ifrs uh, sphere the issb uh, right. which are a clone of the csrd so it's basically global <laughs> yes uh and I, I i should have been more um forthright on that absolutely uh, but the issb is not a required reporting no. structure yet and it's that requirement aspect of the csrd that really excites me. You can't duck this. This is not something that you do when you got nothing better to do. This is something you're required to do and there are financial penalties if you don't. So get with the program or there are penalties. It's high time we did this. And again, Europe is leading the way. Sure. Okay, thanks. Thanks for that, Bob. Um, and incidentally, we did run a, a story uh, quite a few months ago on the issue show with an article in France about in France about how theoretically some directors could actually face jail sentences if they don't follow uh, uh, sustainability directives. So <laughs> this is not something to be messed around with. Um, Petter, now you meant, uh, when I was reading your bio earlier, I picked up that you did some work in Brazil and you spotted a story on Reuters relating to Brazil. Brazil, Ready's new investment vehicle for sustainable projects. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yes, I thought this was an interesting story for several uh, reasons. Really, one is uh, one is that uh, it's a significant amount of money that is being made avail uh, available for um, sustainable projects. I believe it was twenty billion US dollars, and also. Um, We've heard stories from Brazil over recent years uh, saying that uh, companies there and consumers uh, are not really interested in the ESG, that they're sort of lagging behind. And also, um, for, the, for the reason that we, when we're talking about double materiality and we're talking about CSRD and so on, it's, it's, as Bob mentioned, it's very much driven out of Europe. And now you see that things are happening in many places in the world, and I believe we have a pretty global audience on this uh, on this show as well. And I think uh, the implications of of this will be that concepts like double materiality and uh, so on will be uh, brought in and uh, taken on board quickly in uh, other other areas where they have not been so much at the forefront yet. I also thought that. Um, uh, one interesting aspect of this, when I read it, was that um, solar and wind uh, are not included because they are, as of today, regarded as mature industries. They are not uh, uh, part of the what they regard as sustainable uh, new businesses that they want to focus on. But um, just uh, really to try to uh, put a little bit of a global perspective and angle on it, I think these are these are early indicators uh, in a way of uh, things happening that will require uh, 
the sort of conceptual frameworks as well as regulatory frameworks to fall in place um, relatively quick, quickly. And um, then it will also make sense for Brazil, like uh, a number of other countries, to kind of take on board these concepts that have been developed and put, and put them into implementation uh, quickly. Okay, thank you for that, Petra. I think that with wind and solar being, um, you know, now mature um, industries, I mean, I, I understand why they would argue that, and indeed they're already very cost effective. I think the real challenge with solar and wind now is actually connect connectivity to the grid. I think it's the underlying infrastructure that they need rather than the actual wind and solar. I think wind and solar is incredibly cost effective, but the infrastructure that they require is where the is where the money's required. Now, Runa, you spot, well, actually, you did a bit of a compare and contrast piece, a, 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 a kind of a good news and a bad news story. Uh, an article in the UK and the Daily Telegraph about the new energy secretary, as, as people watching this program might, might be aware, we have a new government in the UK and the new energy secretary, Ed Miliband, uh, uh, overall was officials with immediate ban on North Sea oil. Um, meanwhile, in the US, banks abandoned their minimum environmental standards project, alarming cr climate groups. So uh, can you very, very, very briefly uh, enlighten us a little bit more about these two stories? Yeah, it's an it's, um, example of the, that this is difficult um, and it can change uh, without um, uh, um, Suddenly, uh, it can suddenly change because uh, the U.S. bank, the five uh, largest U.S. banks, they, they, um, they um, uh, banned uh, um, exploration uh, north of Alaska far, three years ago, four years ago. All the five, the five banks said that no, we are not financing that kind of activity, and uh, we don't want you as uh, as clients either if you do that. And that's three, three or four years, three and a half years ago. Uh, and now they change by uh, abandoning the, the equator principles um, at the same time as England uh, is starting to, uh, to, to, uh, to discuss blocking of exploration in the Northern Sea. So it can, it can change very fast. That's, that was uh, yeah. the example of this. Uh, so the yeah. risk risk um, uh, feeling can change very fast if something else uh, is more important. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To be honest, I've always thought that the battle against climate change can be won, providing we're not stupid. And unfortunately, I think as a as a as a species, we are capable of being very stupid. But uh, uh, <laughs> it seems to me that the, the the economics of renewables is so compelling now. That we kind of what we need to do is what's right for the economy, but I don't know. We don't always seem to do that. But anyhow, yeah. So, so basically, basically, my point is that it is the cash flow, the the the, the anticipated cash flow in the future and the, in the short future that is running uh, that are uh, material for the decisions today. Um, so the, a little bit forward forward looking uh, is is necessary to, to cope with the risk uh, today. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right, thank you. Okay, thanks for that. I suppose that turn ties in with net current value and concepts like that. Okay, thank you for that. So mm -hmm. I thought we could um, dive in a little bit more detail into double materiality. And I was a bit naughty. Well, I don't know, a bit naughty. I thought a bit of fun. I'd see what ChatGPT <coughs> has to say about double materiality. And it says double materiality is a concept used in the context of corporate reporting and sustainability that acknowledges that the impacts and dependencies between a company and the environment and society operate in two directions. The concept recognizes that, oops, um, financial material, financial materiality, you'll have to, excuse me, while I lean forward to be able to read this on my screen. Traditional financial reporting focuses on how environmental, social and government issues impact the company's financial performance and position. This perspective considers the financial implications of ESG factors and the company itself, such as risks and opportunities that could affect its cash flow, financial con conditions and overall business performance. 
environmental and social materiality, this aspect considers how the company's operations and activities impact the environment and society. It goes beyond the financial impact on the company to include the broader consequences of the company's action on external stakeholders, such as the local community, ecosystems, and broader societal well-being. It says, finally, the chat GPT concludes, double materiality, therefore, requires companies to disclose information that is material from both perspectives. How ESG factors affect the company's financial performance and how the company's activities affect the environment and society. This holistic approach to materiality is increasingly being recognised in regulatory frameworks and reporting standards, aiming to provide a more comprehensive view of the company's overall impact and performance. So, Bob, I wondered how you thought we were doing. Do you reckon that uh, the chat GPT was, got it right there, or do you think that we could perhaps do a bit better than that today? Well, as usual, the, the chat GPT answers are, are amazingly good. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, really, really good. Uh, it, it just builds on what we've been saying all along about inside out and outside in. Um, it, it refers to the what I call a nested interdependencies model of sustainability, where you have the, the business in the middle and society surrounding it and the environment surrounding society. Those are the nests. And what we're talking about in the inside out uh, direction is the impacts of the company on society and on the environment. We've been talking about that for years and Global Reporting Initiative has been the framework that has been the preferred one for most organizations to do that. Really important. Um, now we're talking about the other direction. We're talking about the impacts on the business coming from society and from the environment, and especially from the environment in the, in the form of climate change and the risks associated with that. So when it talks about financial materiality of the outside in uh, risks, what it's talking about is the way in which the company could be financially impacted, financially impacted by climate change, either directly because of severe weather events or whatever, or their suppliers and the transportation routes between them and their suppliers could be impacted. So they have indirect impacts as well. So looking at those risks as Runa did a great job of describing, it's a risk kind of analysis. Whereas the inside out ones, are looking at the impacts of the company on society and on the environment. And the label usually used for that are sustainability kinds of things. And the label used for the other kinds of risks, the outside in ones are usually called ESG. And rather than reporting, it's usually called disclosures because we want them to disclose the risks. So the language, the terminology gets used differently, but uh, I thought the GPT, <laughs> Uh, answer to your question was amazingly succinct. Okay, thank you for that. And uh, Petra and Runa, do you have, before we move on to the next sort of topic, do you have anything to add about the sort of the definition of chat GPT? Anything, uh, sorry, the definition of double materiality? Anything to sort of to add to that? I'm happy to go on, Michael. Yep. Please. <laughs> the chat uh, oh. GTP is quite good here. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, right. So, so why do we need double materiality? Um, Petter, do you, do you have any thoughts about that? What, what, why? Why? Yeah, I think you know an interesting point about this for, from my perspective is that. Um, now, uh, of course, this is driven as a regulatory initiative from the uh, from from the European Union initially, and the, and as as Bob pointed out, it's like uh, it's setting a standard, and it's a great uh, initiative that is uh, raising the bar, setting setting a standard that should be uh, should be um, fulfilled by surely companies in Europe, but also uh, you know. The, setting a standard that would no doubt be followed by many other com uh, countries around the world. 
However, I think also that double materiality, and this goes back to the point I made initially about uh, this also at the core of it being a common sense approach. You should be doing this whether you have to or not, because it's about um, it's about assessing and understanding uh, risks and opportunities at the at the end of the day. It's about the, uh, assessing and understanding how things impact your business and how your business impacts uh the world of external to your business and uh, meaning the environment and the planet basically and then and and uh and uh, the um uh, the core of this is really that uh, you you should be doing this whether you have to or not because it uh, as a business leader you will need to fully understand all these all these factors and fully understand what implications the implications are for your business in terms of the risks, the opportunities, and at the end of the day, how sustainable uh, and future-proof your business is and will be at the end of the day. Um, oh, sorry, I was chatting away there and I didn't realize I wasn't on the screen. I uh, said, so thank you for that, Peter. Um, Bob, Bob and Runa, do you have anything to add on why we need double materiality. Well, I, I totally agree with what Petter was saying, that it's just an ex extension of what businesses have always had to pay attention to or supposed to pay attention to or been been trained and educated to pay attention to. It just adds a little bit more uh, language to it, um, but it's the same stuff. It's how to run a business. Look at the opportunities, look at the risks, um, and it just acknowledges as well that in the 21st century, uh, some of some of us may remember Porter's five forces, Michael Porter's five forces and, and his model. There are a couple of more forces that need to be taken into account now. There are environmental forces and social forces. So uh, there are now seven forces, maybe eight if you include technology. Uh, so we, we, we've got a, a more uh, robust set of forces which organizations need to take into account as they are uh, planning their business, their strategies, and so on. So it's just good business to pay attention to this stuff. Okay, thank you for that, Bob. Runa? <clears throat> and I also think that uh, the double materiality concept is uh, making things easier for, for the companies. Um, and uh, the first thing is the inside out, the metrics, what the company um, activities in the company inside out uh, is all about and that uh, most companies don't know that so the ESRS could be uh, the data points and ESRS uh, could be uh, a good guide for the companies to a long list of 1,003 uh, 1, metrics but uh, <laughs> if you take that down to the 10 or the five or the three most important for the company, then uh, then they are on the then they are starting. <laughs> okay, thanks for that. Now, um, I, Bob, we, we were talking about how double materiality can give you a clearer view. Um, can you expand on that point? Well, it, it comes back to the level of detail that Rona was just describing. Uh, sometimes the terminology is is sort of a a fog over what exactly we're talking about. And uh, he referred to the ESRS, the um, European Sustainable Reporting Standards. Uh, when you get into the standards, you start to get into the detail. And when you get into the detail, it becomes a lot clearer. And I would commend to anybody that's, uh, that's watching uh, this little quick reference guide, which was put out by the GNA organization, Governance and Accountability Organization. And it's, e it's an ESRS quick reference guide. And it has a thumbnail description of environmental green kinds of, of standards and the blue ones as well. Uh, so it, um, it's a great bird's eye view of what the heck this is all about and the way in which um, organizations need to pay attention to not only uh, the impacts that they're having on the environment and society as well as the other direction as well. And it, 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 it's wonderfully educational, 
blows the smoke away from all of this stuff. So what exactly are we supposed to be paying attention to? It just lays it out. And I would really commend that uh, to anybody. It's on the GNA uh, website, downloadable. Just put in GNA uh, quick reference uh, guide and, and uh, it'll pop up in a Google search. Okay, thanks for that. When I was a, a kid, I had a map of the wall of the world on my bedroom wall, and it had the pictures of all the pri all the world leaders at the time. I won't tell you who the world leaders were at the time because it will show my age. But it's funny. I, I could I can give you a much better idea of who the world leaders were then than I can today. Uh, but maybe um, maybe we should, politicians should put that chart up on their bedroom walls. So that might be a, a good move. I think. But uh, um, uh, Peta and uh, Runa, do you have anything? to add on the on the on the on the point about giving a clearer view no it's 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 more about it's, it's about metrics so cut the the the, the overall bullshit and go down to the metrics that's uh, where the 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 value is exactly so, that's where the clarity is <laughs> okay uh, yeah. metrics, if I can add one little uh, tiny point here, uh, it's just that, uh, as, as Runa mentioned, this makes actually makes it easier for companies to do, approach this in a structured and uh, you know balanced way. And this is uh, also how it should be regarded for companies, not as another overwhelming sort of uh, um, overload of uh, new regulation that you have to deal with and you only de deal with because you have to deal with it. This is something that uh, will help you ultimately to future-proof your business, being more competitive, stronger, and uh, and uh, re more resilient for the future. So that's how you should be, uh, be looking at it. Okay, so thank you for that. Now, when we were chatting the other day, um, something that sort of came home to me was the, the importance of the task force on climate related final dis financial disclosures, TCFD. Um, and I think that's, that, that provides an important sort of background to, to double materiality. Um, I don't know who who wants to to take this discussion off about the importance of TCFD. Uh, Peter, do you want to chat about that for a, tell us a little bit more about that for a couple of minutes? Sure. I think uh, I think the TCFD, um, the um, uh, task force for uh, for financial uh, disclosures, but it was basically uh, climate related financial disclosures, really set a standard in uh, the whole area of the, of ESG. Although it was more focused on climate related uh, uh, things um, obviously as uh, said from says from its name as well this has evolved into a whole lot of um, both regulations standards and frameworks that are very important uh, now the task force also as its name says it's uh, it was a task force so it has basically done its uh, its mandate and it's uh, moved on in different shapes and forms through different organizations and so on. But I think the standards that were set there both for how to how to assess risks and opportunities, what implications of this for governance and strategy and so on, has been incredibly important and has in many ways um, basically laid out the tracks for the further development to happen along those. and. Uh, you know, I've, as I've been working with the clients in this area, and, and in many cases where regulations are sort of still taking shape and still, you know, being developed, the conclusion has often been that let's stick with TCFD and the, and the direction that is laid out there, because if we do that, we will be on the right track and we will be taking the direction that uh, regulation and uh, you know requirements will be basically following through with and and will be taking will be uh, will be uh, developing in that same direction so so I think um, it has it has been incredibly important for uh, for the ASG area and has basically laid the foundation for what has been happening and what is happening and what is now taking shape through various regulations and so on. Okay, thank you for that. And Bob, do you have anything else to add about the the, the task, the task force, the TCFD? 
No, I just want to re <clears throat> want to reinforce that as as Petter said, it's it's really the origin of a lot of this double materiality uh, perspective, and uh, reinforces the the risk lens that is being brought to some of these issues. It was uh, just as background as, a, as I think some folks know. Um, it was initiated by Mark Carney when he was the governor of the Bank of England that oversees all the banks in England and the insurance companies in England. And he was concerned that they were not taking appropriate account of the potential exposure that the companies they were lending money to or insuring, the exposure that those companies had to climate-related risks. So this, he, <laughs> as I've often said, the, the task force wasn't trying to save the world. They were trying to save their assets. Yeah. <laughs> they were trying to make sure that they weren't putting their money into risky ventures, risky because they were exposed to climate related impacts. And it's pretty damn simple. You know, if, if they are in a location that is susceptible to severe weather events or their suppliers are, or their customers are, then that's going to directly or indirectly affect their financials. So could you please tell us in the short, medium and long term, how your financials might be impacted by climate change? Pretty simple. Okay, so it's about saving your ass, not saving the planet then. Uh, Runa, I, I, any, anything you want to butt in? Oh, so <laughs> I'm a big fan of TCFT and I follow it from the start and uh, from uh, the, the, the big speech that Mark Carney had on the Lloyd's uh, event in 2014, uh, which started the financial markets and which are now the CSRD and the ISSB, basically. <laughs> so okay, I'm a okay. big fan, big fan of this uh, this approach, and I'm very glad that it's now mandatory uh, in Europe, and uh, and uh, it has been developed uh, pretty fast. Um, in, uh, so it's a good it's a good uh, good uh, concept. All right, great. Thanks. I'm a fan of Mark Carney as well. As for what it's worth, I think he was by far and away the best governor the Bank of England have ever had. But anyway, that's my opinion. Um, Peter, we were, we were talking about giving advice about a double materiality, and, and you mentioned about the importance of not getting bogged down in detail. Um, can you, I think it was you that said that, can you expand on that? I think it was uh, Bob who said that, was it? Uh, oh, was it? Uh, oh, dear. I'm, 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 Sorry. <laughs> But I, anyway, no, I think I think uh, I think it's important to use this as uh, as you know you have to use the framework for uh, first as a guidance to get the direction and priorities and understanding of of importance of different factors that are that are relative to your business. The, thus, the term materiality, how how material is it? But in order to have a thorough uh, thorough uh, double materiality assessment you need to drill down into the into the nitty-gritty details of these areas and there's only when you do that that you will you will really get to uh, get to uh, do a proper assessment and a proper evaluation of how uh, how material these things are and what you can do to impact it in different ways i think it was someone else who brought up the, t the topic so i i want to pass it on to pass it on okay yeah I, I just want to reinforce it it's it's sort of the uh, the dichotomy between a level of detail that helps explain and understand what it is that's all about but doesn't get you bogged down um, mm. so uh, when you're producing <laughs> your your pro formas of your future financial statements your operating statement and and your um, net worth and so on, uh, all of those things um, have numbers in them. And of course, numbers, especially monetized numbers, um, sound like a lot of detail. So the challenge is to be able to produce the reports that the TCFD is asking you to do without tying yourself in tight little knots because it's looking for forecasts, 
pro formas of future financial statements, which are hard enough to do without thinking about climate change impacts. Mm -hmm. and so the, the level of detail is driving companies nuts uh, because in some cases they've been asked to not only look at what happens if the temperature of the world goes up on average one and a half degrees or maybe two degrees or uh, centigrade or maybe three degrees above pre-industrial levels. So how does how do those levels of financial crisis impact your future financial statements? Wow. Um, so uh, it's 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 a challenge to get the right balance to get the information without um, traumatizing the people who are trying to provide it. Okay, thank you for that. Thought. No, I that that's why uh, it's also important. I'm sorry. No, no, you. Oh, that's why it's also important to uh, to to screen the, the the metrics and also exclude what's not necessary for this company and this value yes. chain. Uh, it's not uh, material. So if um, if um, uh, one uh, one have two or three five uh, two, uh, um, uh, metrics that uh, that are material that that should be um, a good start. Totally okay. agree. Okay, we have a question uh, from. Sorry, Peter. Yes, uh, just one uh, comment following up from from uh, both Bob and Bruno here is that Bob mentioned that. It, 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 you should go into the details without getting bogged down in them. And I think this is a, this cannot be, a, uh, you know, th this is a, this is a point that is just uh, so important and uh, uh, cannot be overstated. Is that a lot of companies get lost in detail because you don't have the direction, you don't know where to go, and you go into uh, analysis that uh, kind of. Go, drills down into uh, deep into number of areas without really getting you uh, clarity or direction. So the good thing, a great thing about this framework is that you, uh, this conceptual framework is that you can do this while having a clear direction and a clear priority. You, you go into the most important areas and you dig down into the details of those. You still, you, you're able to go into detail while also having clarity on direction and a good overview of things. Okay, thanks for that, Peter. So Robbie made a comment. I like I like I like any comments that start with a with a phrase, great show. But he's also <laughs> got a question. Uh, does the panel have any guidance for establishing impact boundaries? Yeah, I, I think I'd defer to Runa uh, on that one. You're probably closer to it. So the boundaries very usually have to do with uh, organizations and their subsidiaries and where they're operating. That's one kind of boundaries. And it also has to do with material impacts um, to the environment uh, as well. So boundaries get used a lot of different ways. But Runa, what, what do you think? Uh, I follow the money. Uh, where is cash flow? It's risk. Uh, so uh, follow the money and the value chain. How is this uh, this uh, business uh, model uh, created? So it starts with following the money. Yeah, <laughs> it's so my, uh, advice. The, val the value <laughs> chain is the boundary. So you're looking at the value chain of the organization. Yeah, what you need uh, in the end, and what uh, where does it start? Yeah, good point. Okay, now we, we are drawing to a close now, but I thought it would be a good idea if I gave you each a, a minute each to um, maybe maybe some advice for organizations in the context of double materiality, or just an important point, an important take home. So I thought I'd give you all a minute each to say advice or, or just something important that you want people to, 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 to take away from this about um, materiality. Um, and Petra, you're kind of nearest to me on the screen, so I thought I'd let you go first. So, uh, how, okay. how, is, how does that? All right, I'll uh, be happy to do that. And um, at the risk of repeating myself, I will just, uh, you know, uh, say that approach this as a way of um, of um, 
of basically uh, uh, developing and strengthening your business and your business strategy. It's not about, uh, don't think of it as another overwhelming uh, compliance issue that you have to deal with. Think of it as a help for you to strengthen and future-proof your business. It's at the end of the day about your business, your risks, your opportunities, how they impact the future of your business. And you basically lay out, a, uh, you develop through this a solid, approach to all of those and solid understanding and a solid uh, plan for how you will uh, deal with it so think of it think of it as as that it's not uh, it's not compliance overload it's uh, a help to future proof your business okay thank you for that Petter. um bob uh yeah just building on that and something that Petter said before as well um that it's just smart business to pay attention to these things and you don't need a government to tell you to run a smart business, to be smart about how you run business, run a business. So even though you may not be required yet to report on or disclose all of this stuff to the external world, internally, you should be looking at all of these things anyway, because they have business impacts, financial impacts. And smart business people look at both opportunities and risks and uh, they do that because they're not being asked to do that by somebody on the outside. It's how they have run a successful business. So don't wait. Don't wait for somebody to force you to do all of this. Do it because it's just smart business. Okay, thank you for that, uh, Bob. And Runa, over to you. Totally agree. Uh, it's. This is not uh, this is not uh, voluntary. Uh, it's five and a half years to 2030. Uh, we have been now above uh, one and a half degrees now for over 12 months. Uh, so it's very very urgent. So this the, the companies that don't have started start right now and start with evaluating uh, the business uh, data that uh, the inside out. Uh, factors right with that yeah but okay. start to right now <laughs> right i think we need to finish now i just wanted to know whether that one of you not all three of you just one of you wants to have a go at responding to this comment here in about 30 seconds and then and then it will and then we'll be it will be we'll be closing so anyone want to have a quick comment on that comment on this this comment I think it relates to the two stories that Runa uh, took a look at. Uh, things change very, very quickly depending on who's in charge of the, of the country. Um, and um, although I think it's good advice, uh, I don't think we should wait for governments or stock exchanges to, to litigate all of this stuff and, and make it mandatory. I think we should just do it anyway. Okay, thank you very much and thank you everybody. And um, the No ESG show for a couple of weeks, I think we're back on August the 7th when we're doing the business case for the rainforest. Uh, but thank you. Thank you, Bob, Petter and Runa. And uh, thank you all for watching and see you all soon. Thank you.